This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. You're listening to Kalam Institute's podcast series, Sirah, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at kalaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Kalam Institute. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Shall I continue with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In the last couple of sessions we've been talking about the migration of the Muslims to Abyssinia, to Habasha. What we talked about was, we talked about um, the two separate migrations that occurred. The first migration to Abyssinia, which was a very small group of people, uh, 15 or 16 people, they were there literally for two months uh, before returning back to Mecca. We talked about those circumstances. And then when many of them returned back to Abyssinia, realizing Mecca was still not safe, then follow, basically they were followed there by um, almost 80 more Muslims bringing the number of Muslims total in Abyssinia to a hundred Muslims. Now, once about a hundred Muslims had left Mecca, emptied out of Mecca, and collected in Abyssinia, that obviously brought a lot of people's attention to the fact that, where did all these people go, and what are they doing, and where are they going, and what's going on with them? So the Quraysh, in last week's session, we talked about how the Quraysh decided to send uh, an, a convoy to go and pursue them, and to bring them back. So when the Quraysh, Amr bin al-As radiallahu anhu, who later on would accept Islam, and Umar um, bin Walid bin Mughira, he, they both arrive there, they, bring, they come with a lot of gifts, a lot of money, basically stuff to bribe uh, people with. They first go and they meet up with some of the ministers of the king, the Jashi. By meeting with these uh, ministers, they're able to win the favor of these ministers by bribing them, giving them expensive gifts. They're able to win their favor. And then they basically proceed on to requesting the ministers to gain them an audience with the king, an Najashi, Negus. So they go before the king, and they present themselves bowing down in front of the king, presenting all these luxurious gifts before the king. And it's actually said about the king that the king was very fond of, I talked about this last time, of uh, camel hide, the skin of camels. He was very fond of that. So they present the, these camel hides, big, red, beautiful, magnificent camel hide to the king. And the king is very happy and very uh, appreciative. And so the king gives them the floor. He says, yes, what would you like? And they basically say, and their, their strategy at this point in time is, they said that some of our abid, some of our abid, which means slaves, these are slaves of ours, sufaha, abidun sufaha. These are foolish slaves that we have that have ran away from home, they've ran away from their owners and their masters, and they've come here and taken refuge, O great king, in your great kingdom. And that's the strategy, that they're going about this. That these are slaves, rebellious, foolish slaves, who have, you know, ran away from home, and they're here, and they're taking refuge here. And we're here to basically take them off your hands, recollect them, and return them back to where they rightfully belong. So the king and the Jashi, his truthfulness, his fairness, it shows from the very beginning that the king Najashi tells them that even if that is the story, find their slaves, their owner, their own, their property, and they're, they're rebellious, and they've ran away. Even then, I cannot take somebody who has come to me and my kingdom for refuge, I cannot take him and hand him over to you unless I hear both sides of the story. I need to, I have to. And this was one of the wisdoms of the Prophet ﷺ, this was one of the reasons why he sent the early believers to Habasha. Because he knew there was a king who had this reputation there. So the king requests the Muslims, the immigrants, to basically come and present themselves in the court of the king. 
And so the Muslims come the next day, they're very worried when the news arrives, Umm Salama radiallahu anha, who had migrated here along with her husband, Abu Salama, that later on her husband would die and she would later on become one of the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, one of the mothers of the believers. At this point in time, she was married to her husband Abu Salama. He had not passed away yet and they were one of the couples, one of the families that had come here to Abyssinia. She's narrating the story. She says that when we got the news that the king wanted to see us, we had lived in anonymity. We had kept a low profile. We, had, we were minding our own business. We weren't messing with nobody. That when we heard that the king is asking for us, we were very worried. She said everyone got very nervous and everyone was very worried. Remember, the Muslims did not have a good experience with authority. The time of Makkah did not go too pleasantly for the Muslims. So they were extremely worried, very nervous, what are we gonna do? So they got together, some of the leaders of the group, Uthman radiallahu anhu was in this group of people, Abdurrahman bin Auf radiallahu anhu was in this group of people, Ja'far bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was in this group of people. So there were many very qualified and capable leaders in this group. So they got together, they huddled up, they said, let's figure this out. They said, look, we don't know what it's about. We cannot go in here assuming the worst. We have to be hopeful. And we have to be confident. And we have to go in there, we haven't done anything wrong, we intend to do nothing wrong. We have the best of intentions, we are here to live quietly, privately, a life of freedom, and the ability to worship Allah, and we do not want to step on anyone's toes. And all we have to do is go and express that. So they decide, okay fine, we're good, they calmed everyone down, everybody relax, everybody's okay. And they appoint Ja'far bin Abi Talib. This is Ali radiallahu anhu's older brother. Ja'far radiallahu anhu was also a very early convert to Islam. He accepted Islam very early on. Of course his brother Ali radiallahu anhu, who grew up in the home of the Prophet ﷺ, lived in the Prophet ﷺ's home, in his household, was you know, the second person to accept Islam. But Ja'far radiallahu anhu soon thereafter accepted Islam as well. And just like Ali radiallahu anhu did not live with his father Abu Talib, because the father was very old and very busy and very poor, so what ended up happening was the Prophet ﷺ took the financial responsibility of Ali radiallahu anhu and he lived with him and the Prophet ﷺ took care of his bills, if you will, the living expenses. Ja'far radiallahu anhu was similarly taken responsibility for by the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, the younger brother of Abu Talib, Abbas. Who would himself also accept the son later on? So Ja'far radiallahu anhu is the son of Abu Talib, so obviously a very you know, wise father, and a lot of times that wisdom passes on, qualities and traits are inherited. So Ja'far radiallahu anhu is very calm, cool and collected. By nature, his quality is described as being somebody who is very calm, cool and collected. He's described as someone, being, who, someone who is very intelligent. He was, he's described as being someone who is very thoughtful. Like he never had knee-jerk reactions, he just wasn't that type of person. Whenever he heard something, he would listen very quietly, he would process it, be quiet, and then he would share if he had anything to share. So he was known by these qualities of being quiet, being thoughtful, being very intelligent, very calm and relaxed. He's described with these qualities. That's why the Prophet of Allah and this something we'll talk about later, but when Ja'far radiallahu anhu, returned from Habasha, from Abyssinia, you know, um, 10, 12, 12 years later, when he came back to Medina, he came, came back to the Prophet ﷺ, meaning it was to Medina, he didn't come back to Mecca, he came to Medina. He came at the time, he arrived back in Medina at the time, when the battle of Khaybar was ending. And when he walked into the camp, the Muslim camp, where the Muslims were camped, at Khaybar. And the battle of Khaybar had just ended, they had just conquered Khaybar. When the Prophet ﷺ returned back to the camp and he saw Ja'far radiallahu anhu and the Muslims from Habasha re- coming finally back to rejoin their community, the Prophet ﷺ said that, I don't know why I'm more happy. Am I more happy about the end of the battle of Khaybar or am I more happy about the return of Ja'far? And he told Ja'far radiallahu anhu that you have brought coolness to my eyes. You're a sight for sore eyes. 
The Prophet ﷺ said about Ja'far radiallahu anhu at that moment, أَشْبَهْتَ خَلْقِي وَخُلُقِي He said, Ja'far, you are my brother. He said, Ja'far, you are my brother. Meaning what? He said, أَشْبَهْتَ خَلْقِي وَخُلُقِي You resemble me in looks. So Ja'far radiallahu anhu looked a lot like the Prophet ﷺ. You could tell they were relatives, they were cousins just by looking at them. They looked like brothers. So he said, you resemble me in my looks, but you also resemble me in my character. Think about what that means. Allah compliments the character of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa tells someone, your character is like mine, you can imagine what his character was like. That Ja'far bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And he was very well spoken, very soft spoken, but very well spoken. And it said about him, I, this is a quality he shared of, uh, again, of course, with his, un- with his father and with his younger brother. This was a quality the whole family had. Abu Talib was very eloquent. Quite a few times in the seerah sessions leading up to this, we, I, I've quoted poetry from Abu Talib. It's very eloquent, very powerful. So Ja'far radiallahu anhu was also very eloquent and well spoken. Well, of course we know about Ali radiallahu anhu. Ali radiallahu anhu was an educator of the ummah. He was, he was very you know, passionate, very knowledgeable, very intelligent when he spoke to people. So ja, they, they get together, the council gets together, the leadership of the Muslims in Abyssinia, and they appoint Ja'far bin Abi Talib. They said, Ja'far, you will speak for us tomorrow. Because the king had requested all the Muslims need to come. Women, children, men, everybody. All hundred of you need to show up. So they packed up their bags and they're all heading out. But if you have a hundred people there, and a hundred people are trying to talk, and somebody starts to freak out, and somebody starts to cry, then all of a sudden you have a mess on your hands. So they said, everyone will go and stand there quietly, calmly, peacefully, and Ja'far will speak for us. And that actually brought a lot of um, confidence to everybody in the group as well. Because they said, okay, if, if all we gotta do is stand there, be quiet and make lots of dhikr and pray to Allah, just be standing there making dua and Ja'far will speak for us, we feel better about the situation. Ja'far knows how to handle himself. So they go before the king, they're presented before the king, and Ja'far radiallahu anhu at this time, you know, he's asked that, some narrations actually say that Ja'far radiallahu anhu presented himself. He said, أَنَا خَطِيبُكُمْ الْيَوْمُ Don't worry, I will speak on our behalf today. فَاتَّبِعُوهُ فَسَلَّمَ وَلَمْ يَسْجُدْ So, the next day now, when they finally arrive at the court of the king, and they enter into the court of the king. Remember when, the, when Amr bin al-As and Umar, the son of Walid bin Mughira, they entered the court, they had bowed down in front of the king. So when Ja'far radiallahu anhu, when all the Muslims are standing there, and Ja'far radiallahu anhu steps forward into the you know, audience of the king, he didn't bow down. He just walked in, he greeted him in a nice pleasant way. He greeted him, whatever the greeting must have been, whatever the formal greeting, like, hello, how are you? You know, and, or, or thank the king. A king is more like praised or thanked. You don't really say howdy to a king, right? When you walk into the court of the king, that, you know, your majesty, thank you for allowing me this audience. So he greeted the king, thanked the king for the audience and walked in. He didn't bow down. Immediately, Amr bin al-As and Umara, they speak up so that the ministers can hear. He didn't bow down in front of your king. So the king overhears. And the king says to Ja'far, he goes, come forward. He goes, why didn't you bow down like you're, these are your people. These are your cousins, your tribe's people. They say you are of relation to them. They bow down, so it obviously is a part of your custom. Don't you follow the custom of your people? You didn't bow down. Ja'far radiallahu anhu, he says to him, Inna la nashdu illa lillahi azza wa jal. He says, we do not bow down in front of anyone except for Allah. So the king says, وَمَا ذَاكَ Tell me about Allah. He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَعَثَ إِلَيْنَا رَسُولًا ثُمَّ أَمَرَ لَا أَمَرَنَا أَلَّا نَشْجُدَ لِأَحَدٍ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ Allah sent a messenger to us, who then told us that we should never bow down in front of anyone, that we should never prostrate in front of anyone except for Allah. 
wa amrana bi salah wa zakah and he's also commanded us to pray and to give charity a more detailed explanation is provided in some of the narrations where he says that when he when Jafar radiyallahu anhu tells him that Allah sent in Allah ba'atha fina rasulan wa huwa rasul alladhi bashara bihi Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam that he is the same prophet that Isa alayhi salam foretold of the coming as well and then he goes on to say fa amarana an na'buda Allah wa la nushrika bihi shay'an and that prophet commanded us to worship Allah alone and not associate any partners to him wa nuqima as-salah and he told us to establish the prayer wa nu'ti az-zakah and to give charity wa amarana bil ma'ruf and he tells us to do good things wa nahana 'anil munkar and he tells us to stay away from bad things some other narrations even go on to talk about that he mentions some of those good things and some of those bad things that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam commands or forbids from for instance he talks about how he's commanded us to be good to our family to respect our parents to take care of orphans to feed the needy and the hungry he forbids us from um fornication from adultery from oppression from wrong from stealing from cursing so he mentions some of these things when najashi hears this the narration says And remember Amr bin Al-As radiyallahu anhu is narrating this himself. He says fa a'jaba Najashi qawluhu. Najashi was very impressed with what Ja'far radiyallahu anhu had to say. He was very impressed. So and the Najashi basically goes on to respond by saying that there is he he basically then he says that i don't see anything wrong with what they believe in i don't see anything wrong with what they say and he actually says he says that this is exactly what isa ibn maryam taught us to do as well this is what isa alayhi salam taught us to do and that's what you say this rasul this man muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that's what he tells you to do so i don't see anything wrong with this situation at all i don't see anything wrong perfectly fine So then Amr bin Al-As radiyallahu anhu he again speaks up and he says that but they have escaped away from us remember the earlier strategy abidun sufaha ghilnanun sufaha these are slaves foolish rebellious slaves that have run away from us so then Najashi asked Jafar that they claim that you are slaves of theirs is that true Jafar bin Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu was almost amused at this comment He was almost amused at this comment. He goes, "How does he say that we are slaves?" He says, "I am the son of the leader of our tribe. My father is more powerful than this man. My father is more respected than this man. My father is the leader of our people. We are equals of theirs. We are not slaves. We are not property. We are equals. So we are brothers in terms of lineage. If I am a slave, then that makes him a slave too." So he says we're not slaves. This is a false claim. So then he turns back to Amr bin Al-As and he goes, "Do you have any proof or any evidence for what you say?" And Amr bin Al-As says, "No, I don't." So then Najashi says, "I cannot hand these people over to you. I will not hand these people over to you." And that's the end of that. And he tells everyone to leave the court. So everyone disperses from the court. Amr bin Al-As, the second he's told everyone's dispersed from the court, the king says, "All right, everybody go, everybody leave. I'm done with everybody." Amr bin Al-As radiyallahu anhu, again this is before Islam, just kind of in the habit of saying radiyallahu anhu because mashallah later on he accepts Islam and is a great sahabi of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Amr bin Al-As leans over to Umar and he says, "I swear to you, I'll be back tomorrow with a better game plan." Watch I I got I got more I just need to sit down I need to figure it out I got something else I can cook up something better So everybody goes the days over everybody kind of retires to their quarters the muslims are staying somewhere near camped out near the uh near the palace or near the you know the 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 capital before they return back to wherever they live they're camped over there overnight and actually the narration says that the king actually says to the believers to the muslims the muslim small little muslim community he says you are my guests 
I will arrange for your dinner. I will arrange for a safe place for you to stay. You are my guests. I do not oppress people. I do not hand people over to oppressors. I do not treat people this way. So he said, you are my guests here for tonight. So the Muslims stay over. Amr bin al-As radiallahu anhu, again before Islam, he goes to an najashi and he says to him, he goes that, O oh king, of course, you know, we, we, we have no argument with your decision. You are the king, we accept whatever decision you make. I just thought that you should know. I just thought that you should know. إِنَّهُمْ يَقُولُونَ فِي الْمَسِيحِ Isa ibn Maryam qawlan azeeman that they say some very very serious stuff about Isa alayhi salam they say some very shocking things about Isa and so the king is a little taken aback a very devout practicing christian and it's actually said about the king that he was literally what you could consider like an alim of his religion he was a student, he was well learned, learned about his religion. And so the king is a little taken aback, he's a little shocked. He says, really? Really? So the next morning he says, everybody to my court, get everybody, summon the Muslims, summon those people who've come from Quraysh to get them, summon the ministers, everybody in the court. And everybody gathers up in the court, and the Muslims say they were even more scared the second day than they were the first day. Because the first day, okay, fine, the king just wants to know who we are. We showed up, we presented ourselves, we talked to the king, we spoke to the king, everything should be done. We don't want, we're not here to make any trouble. So the Muslims come to the court the next day even more scared than they were the first day. And they stand up in front of the king. And again, they, they line up, they show up. Ja'far bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu said things, since things went so well the first day, he's again asked and appointed to go forward and speak on their behalf. And when, when they walk in, and Amr bin al-As and Umar are standing there, big smiles on their faces, smirking. And Ja'far radiallahu anhu goes and stands up in front of him, and the king looks a little perturbed, a little upset. And he goes, what is this I hear? You have something shocking to say about Isa? Al-Masih? You have something shocking to say? What do you say? Ja'far bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And this was a part of the tarbiyah of the Prophet ﷺ. You see, they learned this from the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ taught them this, and he ingrained this. He, 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 he literally, um, he pounded this into them. That the Prophet ﷺ's da'wah was dominated by the Qur'an. He presented the Qur'an to people. He talked to them from the Qur'an, he read to them the Qur'an, he explained to them the Qur'an. And, and I will say one thing very, very honestly. We sometimes get in our own heads, we sometimes complicate things for ourselves. Sometimes we're a little too smart for our own good. Sometimes. Just a little. And that's a problem. Ja'far radiallahu anhu is talking to a non-Muslim. He's talking to a non-Muslim. And a non-Muslim that is, right now, is confrontational. And yet, how does he give da'wah to him? How does he explain the issue to him? Let's take a look. Ja'far radiallahu anhu doesn't say anything. Ja'far radiallahu anhu says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ كَافْ هَيَا عِينْ صَادِ ذكر رحمة ربك عبده زكريا إذ نادى ربه نداء خفيا قال رب إني وهن العظم مني واشتعل الرأس شيبا ولم أكن بدعائك رب شقيا وإني خفت الموالي من ورائي وكانت امرأتي عاقرا فهب لي من لدنك وليا He starts reciting Surah Maryam to him. He begins reciting Surah Maryam, and the narration says that he recites quite a bit of the beginning portion of Surah Maryam, Surah number 19. Till the point where it starts with the story of Zakariya and the story of Yahya alayhim as -salam. And then finally, till he reaches ayah number 16, he says, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَرْيَمْ إِذِنْ تَبَذَتْ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا مَكَانًا شَرْقِيًّا فَاتَّخَذَتْ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا 
فأرسلنا إليها روحنا فتمثل لها بشرا سويا قالت إني أعوذ بالرحمن منك منك إن كنت تقيا قال إنما أنا رسول ربك لأهب لك غلاما زكيا He talks, reads the ayats about Maryam, the mother of Isa alayhim as That how Maryam was chaste and she was pure. And how Allah said, told her to go away from the people and isolate herself. And there she was expecting a child. And an angel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to her and communicates to her that you have nothing to fear from me. I am a messenger of your Lord. And I'm here to tell you that you will be gifted with a pure boy, a son who will be very pure. And now she gives birth to Isa alayhi salam, who is again pure and a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how Isa alayhi salam addresses the people as an infant and says, Inni Abdullahi atani al kitaba wa ja'alani nabiyan. I am a slave of God, I am a slave of Allah. I have been given a scripture, a sacred text from Allah, and Allah has made me a prophet. And it said that by the time Ja'far radiallahu anhu had finished reading these ayat, they, the narration says that there was not a single dry eye left in the court. Everybody was in tears. And it said Najashi was crying so much that his whole beard was wet. He was overcome with emotion, he was choked up. He had to re- regain his composure, it took him a couple of minutes before he could even talk. And Ja'far radiallahu anhu said at that time to further explain exactly what was their belief. He read to them the Qur'an. And then just to explain what was exactly their belief about Isa alayhi salam, he says to him, huwa ruhullah. He says, yaqulu fihi qawl Allah. First he recited to him the Qur'an and then he says, huwa ruhullah. He is the spirit of Allah, meaning he was a soul that was put by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into Maryam. وَكَلِمَتُهُ And he is the result of the command of Allah. أَخْرَجَهُ مِنَ الْعَذْرَاءَ الْبَتُولِ Allah brought him into this earth from the very chaste virgin mother Mary. أَلَّتِي لَمْ يَقْرَبْهَا بَشَرٌ وَلَمْ يَفْرِضْهَا وَلَدٌ that no man had gone near her, nor had you know any type of intimacy or physical relations with her. And this is what he says, and he just is quiet. When the Najashi, the king, regains his composure, the narration says that he bends down off of his throne, his chair where he's sitting, he bends down to the ground, and he sees like a little twig sitting on the ground. He picks up that twig and he holds it up in his court. And he says, Ya ma'ashar al qisiyin wal ruhban. Ya ma'ashar al qisiyin wal ruhban. He says, Oh, you know, um, fraternity of, you know, ministers and priests. Because the court is full of all these ministers and priests and monks. So there are two classes from the spiritual religious leadership amongst the Christian community at that time, there are what we would call the academics or the scholars. There are the academics and the scholars, the priests. And then there are the monks, the worshiper, the worshiping class. So he addresses both of them, قِسِّسِينَ The priests, the academics, the knowledgeable people, وَالْرُهْبَانَ And also the monks. So whether you're on the knowledge side or the, the worship side, he addresses everybody and he says, "Ma yazidu ha'ulai ala ma taquluna fi ibn Maryam, wala wazna hadhihi marhaban bikum wa bi man jitum min indhi." He says that I swear to God that what these people say about Isa ibn Maryam is not even this much different than what we believe about Isa ibn Maryam. It's kind of like an expression. He's saying that what we are supposed to believe about Isa ibn Maryam is not even this much more than what this man has said right now. Identical exactly to the extent, to the level, what he has said about Isa ibn Maryam, that is what we should believe. And what I believe about Isa ibn Maryam. And it's said that when he says this, there are literally like audible gasps in the room. <gasps> because... The Christians of that time, many of them did say, majority of them said, Wa ibnullah. He's the son of God. 
So there were audible gasps in the room. And you have to understand the Najashi isn't emotional just right now. He's obviously deeply spiritually impacted. He listened to the kalam of Allah. But at the same time, he's a, not, he, he's, he's a scholar of his own religion. He has studied the scripture. He says, this is the truth. This man speaks the truth. He recites to us the truth. And so, he goes on to then say, he says, marhaban bikum. He said, all of you are welcome here in my kingdom. وَبِمَنْ جِئْتُمْ مِنْ عِنْدِهِ Subhanallah. And he says that the man that you are coming from, the man that you represent here in my court today, the man who has sent you here to me, he is also welcome. He is welcome with me, anything he needs. I am at his service. And then, he says something very shocking. He says, فَأَنَا أَشْهَدُ أَنَّهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Because I bear witness, I give testimony that he is the messenger of God. وَأَنَّهُ الَّذِي بَشَّرَ بِهِ عِيسَى And he is the one that Isa said would come. وَلَوْلَا مَا أَنَا فِيهِ مِنَ الْمُلْكِ لَأَتَيْتُهُ حَتَّى أُقَبِّلَ نَعْلَيْهِ And he said, if I was not here entrusted with the ruling of my people, the rulership of my people, I would have gone to him and I would have kissed his shoes. I would kiss his feet. He goes, you stay here in my kingdom, wherever you would like, how much you would like, whatever you would like, you are free to stay here. And Umm Salama says that he commanded to his ministers to provide to us clothing and food, because he saw us, many of us in tattered clothing. He saw many of us looked hungry and malnourished from our faces. So he said, provide them with a stockpile of food, and provide Provide them with plenty of clothes and anything else that they need. And he said, Ruddu ala hadaini hadiyatahuma. He said, and these two, Amr bin al As and Umara, these two, give them their gifts back. And I know you ministers, some of y'all got gifts. If I find out any one of you kept gifts that these two gave to you, you have to answer to me. Give them their gifts back. And he and Amr bin al As radiallahu anhu says at that time that we returned back from there very dejected and rejected and confused and we didn't know what to do. And we went back in this form, in this way. Now, that is said and done. The Muslims go back, they settle down in Abyssinia and Habasha, free food, everything is provided for them. Now everybody in the kingdom, already as it was, they were keeping a low profile, the people were very good natured, they minded their own business, they were minding their own business, everybody was minding their own business. But now there was an official edict from the king, saying these people are welcomed by the king, these people have won the favor of the king, now everybody was extra nice to them. And now they're living a great life there in Abyssinia and Habisha. But this is kind of an opportunity for us to talk a little bit about an Najashi himself. One thing that I, I didn't talk about, I wanted to address. If you, if you look at this, an Najashi seems to be, obviously he's a believer, so he must have had at least some bit of or inclination towards Iman in his heart to begin with, and that's why you see such a good natured man. But aside from that, see, we sometimes underestimate the fact that we are all products of our experiences. We are the outcome, the sum of our experiences. And Najashi had a very interesting experience. And Najashi, his dad was, like I talked about before, his name was uh, Mu'asama or A'asama. Um, and his father was the king before him. His father was the grand king, An Najashi. And when his father passed away, this particular king, this An Najashi, he was a boy, he was a very small child. His dad's younger brother, his dad's younger brother at that time, was basically told that, look, the boy is kind of young, he might need some help in terms of running of the kingdom and things like that. So why don't you kind of, you know, supervise things, kind of run things until, you know, the young boy is not ready to rule. But that brother was surrounded by, you know, 
some other people who are power hungry and things like that. And so they basically told the brother, they said, come on dude, seriously? So you're telling us you're going to rule for a little while and then all of a sudden hand the keys over to this boy? Who's here to stop you? Get rid of the boy. Get rid of him. And then rule. So they decide, the man is sold. He says, the great idea. So what they do is, in the middle of the night, they sneak in, they kidnap the boy, an Najashi. And they take him and they literally, you know, strip him down from his clothes, put some tattered old clothing on him, scuff him up, dirty him up a little bit. And they go and they drop him off into the slave market. Random boy, scuffed up, dirty, looks like everybody else, all the other captives, all the other slaves. And you drop him off there to be sold off as a slave. A little while later, what ends up happening is that some of the, when, when the people wake up in the morning, and everyone's like, okay, where's, where's the boy king? Where is he? Where'd he go? Nowhere to be found. The people realize that there is some foul play going on over here. The, the prince has done something with the king, with the boy, and something shady is going on over here. And a rebellion starts. And many of the loyalists and the lovers of the previous king, they stand up and they say, no, something shady has happened here. He's gotten rid of our rightful king. We can't let this happen. And a rebellion. And there's a civil war. And the whole country is in turmoil. And the king, the, 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 the prince, he realizes that the only way to quell this is I gotta bring this boy back. So he sends his people out and he says, find the boy no matter what the cost. Find him, bring him back. And so they go and they look for him, they find out he was sold off this, this, this. They eventually track him down and they bring the boy back. Now of course, he's a boy, he's been traumatized, he's been sold off and you know, kept as a slave for some time. So they bring him back, but now you know, that type of an experience kind of matures you, teaches you something. And they bring him back and they put him back and they say, oh, he got lost, you know, he was kidnapped. We found him though and we you know, punished the people who had kidnapped the king and we brought you, your king back, etc, etc. So some of it kind of settles down, but now the boy also realizes that you know, my uncle's trying to get me out of the picture here. So the boy grows up really fast, matures. He basically le goes, you know, leans on some of the people who were very close to his father that he feels he can trust and tells them, look, they came and they snatched me out of my bed in the middle of the night, dropped me off, sold me off as a slave. This is, I swear to you, this is what happened. So they build together kind of a group together. They reach out to some of the army and the generals and some of the tribes that are loyalists of the previous king. And they put a whole group together and they launch an entire rebellion like basically a war against the crown prince. The crown prince has his own people, and next thing you know, there's a civil war going on. The civil war eventually ends, the rightful king, the boy king, he basically, and Najashi, he wins the war, sits into his proper place as the king of Abyssinia, and imprisons the crown prince and the other people who had done this type of stuff. So, the point that I'm trying to get is that this king had come from a lot of turmoil and a lot of difficulty. He was coming from a difficult place. And he had been through this type of adversity and hardship in his own childhood as a child to go through a kidnap, imprisonment, slavery, and then a civil war for what is rightfully yours. And so this king had these experiences and did not like war, did not like oppression, did not like these things. And that was part of the reason why this king was known as such a soft-hearted, generous, kind-hearted, understanding king. Because he had been through hardship himself. He had lived life as a slave. Think about that. A king who has lived as a slave, think about how compassionate he would be. How understanding he would be. How empathetic he would be. And so an Najashi possessed these qualities. That was part of the reason why he had such a deep study of his own religion. He was deeply spiritual because of the life experiences that he had had. And it's actually mentioned that... So fast forwarding now to this scene right here, Ja'far radiallahu anhu presents and speaks and recites Qur'an in the court of the king. The king stands up in that state, in that, that boost of iman that he is experiencing. Ashhadu annahu rasulullah. 
says about Muhammad وسلم, I swear I give testimony that he is the messenger of Allah. Now, the ministers and everybody huddles up afterwards. Say, we got a little bit of a situation on our hands. The king said kind of some crazy stuff yesterday. So they tell the king, you have to take it back. He says, I'm not going to take it back. Why should I take it back? So the ministers go out to the court the next day, they gather all the priests and the monks together, and they say that when he said, I swear that he is the messenger of God, he was talking about Isa, not this man Muhammad. You know the king's policy, the king is fair to everyone. He you know, takes care of minorities, so that's why he's not against the Muslims. We should not be against these Muslims, but don't worry, the, court, the king has not forsaken Christianity. He was talking about Isa. He was saying, "Ashhadu annahu ay Isa huwa Rasulullah." So don't worry, the king is fine. They said, "Oh, but he says that you know that what they say about Isa is true." And Najashi said, "I contend that that is true." Now the next thing was that the ministers go to him, and they say that some of this information is leaking out, and your opposition you've quelled you. You know, you won the civil war. You quelled your opposition. You quelled the war. You defeated your opposition. But there are still people out there who are part of that group. And this information is leaking to them. From what we're hearing, they're calling you a heretic. They're calling you a heretic, an abandoner of your religion. And they're trying to raise rile, gain some support against you again. So fine, you won't take your statements back? That's fine, whatever. At the very least, we request you not to speak openly anymore. You believe what you want to believe, we're gonna pretend like we never heard it. We're just gonna look in the other direction. Your belief, these are ministers, right? These are po politicians, not the priests. These are the politicians, the, 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 the secretaries, the cabinet of the king. They say, look, you got your personal beliefs, whatever you believe is what you believe. We're here to make sure that you can run your kingdom properly. We're telling you, don't say anything more about this publicly. There's just no point to it. And so the king at least understanding that there was a civil war in my country, tens of thousands of people died, I do not want to see bloodshed again. So therefore I will keep my opinions to myself, at least I won't say anything publicly. I won't take anything back I said, but I, at the same time I will not advocate my beliefs publicly anymore. I'll just keep my business to myself. And that's what the king basically does. And later on in the seerah it's actually mentioned that there was eventually whether this was a factor in this or not, wallahu alam. But eventually, the the opposition rises up again and launches another attack against the king. And this time, the opposition is stronger than they were the first time. And the king actually is suffering some losses. And when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hears about another civil war in Abyssinia and the fact that the king is this time, you know, losing ground against the opposition, then the the Sahaba radiallahu anhum they actually narrate that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made dua for an Najashi's victory. He made dua for an Najashi's victory. He said that an Najashi he has been good to us. He has been good to our people. And he is a fair and a just ruler. Oh Allah, help an Najashi. And it said, the Sahaba say that shortly thereafter, even though he was losing ground, when the Prophet ﷺ made dua for an Najashi, shortly thereafter, an Najashi's forces made a strong push, and they were able to defeat the opposition, and Najashi remained in power after that. And then eventually, we will talk about, or, or I guess I'll briefly mention it here, that eventually, once the Prophet ﷺ, this is much later after the migration to Abyssinia, so we will talk about an Najashi later on again. But eventually, an Najashi, he accepts Islam. In fact, one of the people who had migrated to Abyssinia was the daughter of Abu Sufyan. Her name was Ramla bint Abi Sufyan. She was married to a man who was again who had accepted Islam in the early days. You know. This is kind of a humbling reminder that you know there are different levels of believers and everybody has their own challenges and their own unique difficulties. So the husband of this woman, this, this believer, Ramla, the daughter of Abu Sufyan, who was a mu'mina, a believer, a muslima, her husband who was also a Muslim, when they went to Abyssinia, whether he was 
you know, emotionally disturbed or mentally ill or the stress of leaving Makkah and coming to Abyssinia, something cracked him. And it said that he started drinking alcohol to the point where he became addicted to alcohol. He became an alcoholic. He was a drunkard. He was drunk all the time. And it said that because he eventually got so bad, he was a raging alcoholic, a drunkard, he was drunk all the time, that in his drunken just state, he was very abusive to his wife as well. And eventually, he, some narration even mentioned that he left Islam. You know, he left Islam and he was drunk, so Allahu Alam, you know, exactly what it qualifies as. Because an intoxicated person is not even in their rightful senses. But he for left Islam and it said that eventually he died because of his alcoholism. He drank himself to death. He literally poisoned his body through alcohol and eventually ended up dying because of over drinking. And Ramla, the daughter of Abu, uh, of, Abu, of Abu Sufyan, the widow of this man who died due to alcoholism, she was pregnant at this time. And she eventually gave birth to a daughter by the name, and she named her daughter Habiba. And therefore she was known as Ummu Habiba. And when the Prophet wasallam, and this is in the years of Medina, this is after Hijrah. When the Prophet wasallam heard that one of our sisters, one of our sisters, one of the Muslim women who went to Abyssinia with her husband, her husband died, a lot of terrible things happened, she was abused. She's there now as a widow by herself and she has a child, she's a single mother and she's there by herself. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, this is not right. We can't just leave her and abandon her in this type of a situation. So the Prophet ﷺ sent word that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ proposes to her for marriage. A widow, she's been through abuse, a single mother, and the Prophet ﷺ proposes to her for marriage. Who? Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ. Right? We would think, unfortunately, a lot of times, a lot of the cultures that are prevalent, somebody would think themselves too good. She's been married previously? Oh. Abused? Oh. Child? Come on. Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu Afzalu khalqillah The best of the creation of Allah Habibu Rabbil Alameen Sends a proposal for this sister And a Najashi actually facilitates the marriage, the proposal A Najashi hosts the messenger that comes from Medina the messenger of the messenger, the one who brings a proposal, he hosts him in the court, he calls Ja'far radiallahu anhu and the Muslim community leaders to bring the sister that is receiving the proposal, bring her the makhtuba, bring her as well. And the Najashi kind of facilitates the proposal and kind of creates you know, a, a bit of a ceremony and a feast and hosts everyone that this is a formal pros, proposal from Muhammad ibn Abdullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to ask uh, in marriage the hand of Ramla bint Abi Sufyan. And she of course accepts the proposal and at that time an Najashi, he then prepares an entire caravan with bodyguards and protection and food and supplies and himself supplies the entire caravan, provides a caravan, and then sends Ramla radiallahu anha, Ummu Habiba radiallahu anha, along with her infant daughter. And an Najashi also then packages gift wraps and sends what will be the mahar from the Prophet ﷺ to Ummu Habiba, says that go and give this from me as a gift to Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ and tell him I am giving them, him this as a gift to give to his wife as ma. And he packages and gift wraps this entire gift that go and deliver this to the hands of Muhammad Rasulullah that this is a mahar for his wife. And he sends this off. So an Najashi maintained a relationship with the Prophet And from this it was very obvious that an Najashi was a believer. 
And it eventually mentions that when the Prophet ﷺ in the ninth year of Hijrah, so this is shortly before the passing of the Prophet ﷺ himself, he receives finally the very sad news of an Najashi passing away. An Najashi has died. When the Prophet ﷺ receives the news of an Najashi passing away, the narration says that the Prophet ﷺ gathers the Sahaba radiallahu anhum together. And, oh excuse me, I almost forgot this part. When Ja'far radiallahu anhu came back at the time of the battle of Khaybar, from Abyssinia, when he arrived back in the majority of the Muslims, that's when they also finally left Abyssinia and returned back to rejoin the Muslim community in Medina. That at that time when Ja'far radiallahu anhu presented himself to the Prophet وسلم, and met the Prophet وسلم, he said that an Najashi has sent a messenger along with us, part of the protection he sent with us. He also sent a messenger. And this was a personal, you know, servant of a Najashi, somebody that was like family to a Najashi, and he trusted him more than anyone else. He whispered a message into his, the ear of the servant and said that, you love me as a father. What I've whispered into your, your ear is for you alone until you deliver it to Muhammad Rasulullah And Ja'far radiallahu anhu said that an Najashi has sent a messenger to speak to you. And an Najashi's messenger finally says that, that an Najashi told me to ask, ma sana'a bihi sahibuna? That what has happened with my friend, talking about the Prophet ﷺ. And he informed him of some of what has been going on with an Najashi. And Ja'far radiallahu anhu go, went on to tell the Prophet ﷺ as well. The, the messenger of an Najashi told Ja'far radiallahu anhu that please tell him. So that it is coming from one of his people personally, please tell him. What is the condition of my king? How my king has treated you? So Ja'far radiallahu anhu tells the Prophet Hamalana, He gave us transportation. Wazawadana, And he provided us with food and materials and supplies. Washahida Allah ilaha illallah. And he gave testimony in front of me that there's no one worthy of worship except for Allah. Wa annaka Rasulullah. And he gave testimony in front of me that you are the messenger of Allah. وَقَالَ لِي قُلْ لَهُ يَسْتَغْفِرْ لِي And he personally requested me, Ja'far said, to tell you to ask Allah for forgiveness on Najashi's behalf. He asked me to ask you to pray for him. فَقَالَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ آمين. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua for the forgiveness of an Najashi and the Mus or actually, excuse me, فَقَامَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ فَتَوَضَّأَ The Prophet ﷺ stood up and made wudu. ثُمَّ دَعَى ثَلَاثَ مَرَاتٍ And then the Prophet ﷺ three times said, اللَّهُمَّ اغْفِرْ لِلنَّجَّاشِ اللَّهُمَّ اغْفِرْ لِلنَّجَّاشِ اللَّهُمَّ اغْفِرْ لِلنَّجَّاشِ Oh Allah, forgive an-Najashi, forgive an-Najashi, forgive an-Najashi. And all the believers, all the Muslims after the battle of Khaybar, who were all present, thousands of them said, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. ثم قال جعفر فقلت للرسول انطلق فأخبر صاحبك بما رأيت من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. And then Jafar رضي الله عنه told the messenger of an Najashi, you have seen what you have seen. Now please go back to our friend an Najashi and quietly, personally deliver to him the news of what you have seen. That Muhammad Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم identifies, accepts and validates the iman of an Najashi and he prays for the forgiveness of an Najashi. And we, the brothers and sisters of an Najashi, the community of Muslims, we also pray for the forgiveness of an Najashi and welcome him welcome him as one of our brothers in faith and iman. And eventually, as I was saying earlier, in the ninth year of prophethood, uh, of hijrah, excuse me, when the Prophet ﷺ finally receives the news of the death of a Najashi, 
it, he says, the Prophet ﷺ basically says that I am very sad to hear about the passing of an Najashi. He was a believer. He is one of us. And the Prophet ﷺ gathers all the Muslims together. He commands them to gather together and he stands up and he prays Salatul Janazah for an Najashi. He laments the death of an Najashi. Na'a Rasulullah sallallahu najashi lin najashi. The Prophet laments the death of an Najashi. He remembers how well he had treated the Muslims and how good he was to these oppressed Muslims, these tattered Muslims who had showed up in his kingdom. And then the Prophet affirms his iman. And then the Prophet says that seek forgiveness on behalf of your brother. And then the Prophet actually prays Salatul Janazah and commands the believers to pray behind him, Salatul Janajah, Lin Najashi, for an Najashi, the king. Now this kind of, so by virtue of the fact that the Prophet ﷺ prays Salatul Janazah for an Najashi, that solidifies the fact that there is no doubt about the fact that an Najashi was a believer, was a Muslim, and he accepted Islam, and the Prophet ﷺ affirmed his iman. The last bit of discussion that kind of comes from this, extends from this. And it's important to talk about this because the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is a resource for us to increase our knowledge and to learn from and take knowledge from. That from this we see the Prophet ﷺ do something very unique. The Prophet ﷺ offers Salatul Janazah for someone who dies in a faraway place and physically is not there is physically not there, which basically is a salah ala al-qa'ib. Praying salatul janazah for someone who dies elsewhere. So not on someone's body, but somebody who dies elsewhere to pray salatul janazah for them. This establishes a precedent. How do we understand this precedent? So there's a difference of opinion between the scholars. Some scholars say that praying salatul janazah Actually, uh, I'll venture to say the majority of scholars say, say that praying Salatul Janazah for someone who is physically not there, to pray it elsewhere. Somebody dies in Pakistan, we pray Salatul Janazah here. For example, that this is not something that is permissible and allowed, generally speaking. A, a minority of the fuqaha, the classical scholars say, no, this is something that is permissible as evidenced by the precedent set by the Prophet ﷺ. However, even those scholars who say that it is permissible, they say that this should only be done, this should be done, should be restricted to the following circumstances. And because of these circumstances, it is precisely because of these circumstances, these preconditions, that the majority of scholars say, generally speaking, we should not do it. First and foremost, that it should only be done in a situation where a Muslim passes away, where maybe his Islam is not known, it is secret, for whatever wisdom, reason, purpose, it is not known, it is secret, and therefore that Muslim does not receive the proper burial rites, as a Najashi obviously would not. And it's actually mentioned in some narrations, that there were still some, a few Muslims, very small numbers of Muslims, remaining in Abyssinia, and this is something I'm gonna talk about later. But when Ja'far radiallahu anhu came back from Abyssinia, he actually told the Prophet ﷺ of the fact that many people, while the Muslims were living there in Abyssinia, they weren't, you know, um, causing any problems, but they were doing da'wah work. And many of the local people in that area had accepted Islam. So when the Muslims, the Arabs, left Abyssinia and returned and came to Arabia, they came back to Hijaz, and they came to Medina, they left behind a community of Muslims whom they had taught how to pray. They had taught the Qur'an to, they had taught to practice Islam. So it said that finally when an najashi had died, the small little group of Muslims that were there in that area, basically went there, to where an najashi was buried, and at a little bit of a distance away, they prayed Salatul Janazah for him. So, but nevertheless, because Islam was still secret, and it was still something that was not generally known, and his janazah still could not be done properly the way it needs to be done for a Muslim, that was one of the reasons why the Prophet ﷺ performed his Salatul Janazah.
And therefore the scholars who say it is permissible, they still say that it should generally be restricted to these types of circumstances. Secondly, especially those scholars who say that it's not something we should generally practice in the community, the, some of the reasoning that they give for not using that as a precedence for the permissibility of it, some of it is, is that number one, this was an exception made by the Prophet ﷺ. And as being the Sharia, as being Rasulullah ﷺ, he has the validity, he has the right and the authority to be able to do that. Do something uniquely in an instance that is not typically to be practiced. Number two, the Prophet ﷺ, again, also took into consideration that Najashi's Islam was not something that was public. So it was very likely that he would not receive a proper Salatul Janazah. And so therefore the Prophet ﷺ was doing it for him as an exception. Not to establish a precedence or to establish its permissibility, but doing it as an exception. Number three, an Najashi being a ruler, this was a gesture of respect done for a ruler by the Prophet ﷺ and not to establish general permissibility and to establish a general precedent. So there, this is kind of the discussion that comes from this. But nevertheless, and fourthly and finally, I almost forgot this, we do not find any other instance. We do not find any other instance of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ ever offering janazah, salatul janazah, for somebody who died elsewhere. Prominent people, beloved people to the Prophet ﷺ, Sahaba radiallahu anhum, many of them died outside of Medina. Ja'far bin Abi Talib, who we talked about, who was so beloved to the Prophet ﷺ, dies at Muta. Some of the Muslims died in Mecca. So there were many other people, even at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, who died elsewhere. They were respectable people, they were beloved people to the Prophet ﷺ. But he's never, it's never been established that he ever, ever again, a second time in his lifetime, did he ever perform Salatul Janazah for anyone else who was physically not there. So therefore, based on the above factors, majority of the scholars say that this is not really an option for us to practice, but it was something that was done as one time, as a one-time deal, as an exception by the Prophet ﷺ for the above said considerations. Wallahu ta'ala alamu bis sawab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. At the end of the day, it is still, even if it is something that is deemed permissible, it still has certain conditions and requirements to it by the scholars who deem it permissible. And this is a difference of opinion that it can be further pursued uh, among scholars, between scholars. And generally the recommendation for communities is to rely upon whatever, whatever is the position of the scholar or the imam or the leader in any given particular community. So generally speaking, for the majority of us, we can generally rely upon the, the opinion, the position of the scholar or the imam of our community. Um, I just wanted to generally mention for our own benefit that this is a difference of opinion that stems from this particular um, incident and situation. And so that is the story of how Ja'far radiallahu anhu represented Islam and Muslims in the court of the king and the Jashi. And a little bit of a brief synopsis of the life story of this Amazing King An Najashi, rahimahullah, may Allah subhanahu wa taala have mercy upon him. And um, the last thing and the final thing, kind of take home point that I wanted to mention that I alluded to a little bit earlier was I'll go back to that and end on this point as a reflection. Look back and think back on how Ja'far radiallahu anhu gives da'wah and represents Islam and Muslims in the court of An Najashi. I talked about this that sometimes. We, 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 we are a little too smart for our own good. And that's obviously sarcasm. What I'm basically saying is we, we sometimes complicate things where they don't need to be complicated. No, we're giving da'wah to non-Muslims. And the Jashi is a king who is a scholar of Christianity who is a little confrontational right now because he's been told as a lie by the representatives from Quraysh, that they say bad things about Isa alayhi salam. So he's a king, a ruler, who is a scholar of Christianity, who is a little upset right now. But yet Ja'far radiallahu anhu recites the book of Allah to him. Surah Maryam. The Qur'an is our most powerful, effective means of delivering the message. We try to outthink the Qur'an sometimes. 
And I'm talking about a lot of times our da'wah takes on the form of this, you know, very intellectual, philosophical, mumbo-jumbo. We get a little too complex, a little too complicated for our own good. And we're sitting there philosophizing to someone, talking to them about all these rational proofs and evidences of, you know, the existence of God and the validity of religion. And did you ever think about this? And then we'll talk, we'll start quoting obscure things about science and medicine and, you know, all these. Look, all of those things are great research. But when we talk about doing da'wah, presenting Islam to someone, we cannot do a better job than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did in the Qur'an. We cannot, we will not. And that's how Muhammad Rasulullah gave da'wah, opened his da'wah. If somebody's got a question about something, a philosophical issue, the existence of God, somebody questions something scientific within the Qur'an, within that something Islam says, fine, by all means delve into that conversation. That's where that research comes in handy. But that cannot be the front line of our da'wah. The front line of our da'wah needs to be the book of Allah, the Qur'an. And, I, and I'm only emphasizing, that might seem like a no-brainer. Somebody might be saying, well of course, duh. What else would it be? No, no, no. Go home and then read. Read the translation of Surah Maryam. Read the translation of uh, Juz Tabarak, Surah Al-Mulk. And then understand that Allah is in fact saying, this is the most effective, powerful means of da'wah. If, you, if I think it's too simple, or it's too spiritual, or it's talking about this, but you know, that stuff doesn't really work, and a lot of times people got other questions, no, 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 no. No, 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 I need to, I need to take it easy, sit back down and realize I am reading the book of Allah, the kalam of Allah, and it is a lot more effective, a lot more powerful, and a lot more you know, fruitful than anything we will ever come up with. Read the book of Allah, understand the book of Allah, and share the book of Allah. That is the essence of da'wah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the people of the Qur'an, and make us effective inviters to the religion of Islam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Mm-hmm.